Uh, hello, I'm extremely honored and happy to introduce to you Eleonora Selmi, who is a humanitarian midwife. And in the larger context of the Postnatal Research Summit, whose topic this year is vulnerability, Eleonora will speak to us what is to be a, a midwife working with mothers with multiple layers of vulnerability. And um, what does that mean and how does one even survive working like this? Welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much to invite me. It's a very special honor to be part of this. And uh, I will be very happy to share my experience. And uh, I try to explain in a better way possible what are my feelings and how was it. Um, just to a little bit uh, introduce myself, I I midwife since 10 years or so, uh, more than 10 years. I work it in a different context, as you mentioned, in um, UK, in uh, Italy, always in a public hospital. But my dream was to work in a different context, in especially in a challenge context like a war zone or in a refugee camp. And so my, I, I tried to follow my dreams. It was not easy because he, uh, you needed to, to be ready professionally, mentally, uh, and have a lot of enthusiasm that sometimes also the people close to you, friends and family, uh, don't understand, don't support. So um, uh, it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, in 2017, I decided to apply for a, a Doctor Without Borders, MSF. And uh, then I start my journey to be a humanitarian midwife. That is not related only to the NGO, but uh, I, I um, find this way to be a humanitarian midwife also in Italy, in other contests, uh, outside the mission, I mean, not only in the mission. <laughs> And uh, my first mission was uh, in South Sudan and uh, was six month mission and uh, was in a huge refugee camp in Doro that is um, close to the Sudan because the Sudan and South Sudan are two different country. And, uh, and who knows the, this context know that it is a very, very vulnerable situation because there is always conflict, there is no school, no education, no water, nothing. <laughs> so there is a disaster. <laughs> but um, that people are so strong, they find a way to survive. And uh, in, my, in that context, I was a supervisor midwife, tried to teach the local midwife and also the traditional birth attendant that was in, in the community, in the village and try to work together to, to of course, uh, improve the quality of the care that we can give to the mothers and the babies. And um, it was a great experience, very enthusiastic experience, very hard for, of course, also the contest, the hot, hot weather, low, not too much food, but uh, very strong. Um, and this is, was really the first mission that to say okay this is what i want this is what i want to do in my life <laughs> at least for a while until i can and then uh, i did another two missions the last one was in afghanistan uh, in last year in uh, in july i back and was totally different because in afghanistan i was in a huge hospital and um, always a, a hospital by msf but uh, the, um, what was uh, amazing to see was the midwife that uh, um, the local midwife that was very very professional and uh, full of skills. So they didn't need me as a midwife, but they need me as a to manage better the the team, uh, uh, the group. Uh, of course, was very challenge not too much for the security contest, but for the COVID restriction and uh, for, and it will be maybe a long discussion, but um, will be I want to just mention 
uh, how much powerful was uh, to see the women under the burqa. My midwife come in hospital uh, with the burqa and then they removed because it was only a female uh, zone. So they feel very protected. And when this, this kind of um, uh, imagine that I keep in my mind, when they remove the burqa and they, you can see the beautiful smile and listen, they dream how much stronger and brave they are that usually we are maybe not uh, uh, used to see a woman like this under the burqa. But the woman under the burqa are really powerful. And this is what I really want to mention because I keep this imagine and, uh, and, and this is what I keep from Afghanistan also. Um, but I think that we will be more focused on, in this uh, session on my big experience in Lesbos because I worked for nine months in um, Moria refugee camp. And uh, be, uh, I start in uh, November uh, 2019 and I finish in August 2020. So I needed to explain a little bit maybe the context to, to, to see what was Moria. Yes, please. I, I will share some picture with you just to explain how big it was. And I want to back from the beginning. Perfect. Because Perfect. We see it. Yeah. Okay. And I want to back from the beginning. Uh, no, this is not the first one. Okay, so just to explain where we are and then to see. So Moria is a village in our islands in Lesbos. Lesbos is a Greek island very close to Turkey. And many refugees from different parts of the world arrive in Turkey, from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, or Congo, Cameroon, South Africa in general. And they try to cross or, uh, and arrive in Lesbos, also in other Greek islands, all here, Samos, Kios, because they are very close. You can really see Turkey from uh, Lesbos. Uh, and, and in 2015 was the first uh, uh, humanitarian crisis where many people was crossing and uh, arrive in Lesbos, then continue to Athens and uh, all the Balkan road. But then there was um, a new European law that uh, uh, stopped the refugee in the place where arrived, and they should um, should uh, do all the application about uh, the refugee status in the place where they arrived. So they couldn't continue the journey as was before. So during the years, uh, all these people were stuck in the Lesbos because uh, the process to get an uh, interview and to get a response about the interview to know if uh, are recognized as a refugees or not was very long, very uh, late the response. So the people start to be stuck in this island and where they find accommodation was in Moria. So here is a uh, picture, maybe I can put bigger. Mm, yeah. Uh, where you, I did this picture from the high plane. This is oh. did by myself. So you can see Turkey here, yeah? how much close is from Lesbos. Incredible. And here, how big was Moria camp? Just I want to mention that Moria is a village that is around here, but Moria camp was a military camp it was designed for um, almost 3,000 people. Uh, when I arrived, uh, well, there was 70,000 70, people. 70? 70, one seven. 17. And 17, 17 people until reach the top before the lockdown uh, in March 22. So 
it was so huge that you can see from the high plan how much big it was. Uh, of course, the condition was not what uh, you expect to have when you are coming to Europe. Um, so maybe I have to reduce it. Okay. So, and this was for this first part, as you can see, is the military camp at the beginning that where can host 2,800 people. And this was after five years, more or less, so exploded because there was no space. So the people arranged themselves with tent, with other shelter around it. And um, there was a hill in front of the clinic where I worked that was, when I arrived, it was just with trees, olive trees. And after one month and two was full of tents. And as you can imagine, around the camp here, there was no electricity, no water, no hot water. Hot water was just a dream also for the people that was living inside. So nobody was caring about uh, uh, also to remove, remove the rubbish the, and clean the camp. So the condition was very, very poor. And uh, so I want to explain a little bit more about my, uh, I mean, my experience and what, I, what was my mission there. I was taking care of uh, mothers uh, and their babies, so antenatal care and uh, postnatal care, but also uh, I was caring about uh, uh, victim of sexual violence. And, and our cleaning was very big. Our clinic uh, was uh, divided into one part for the um, women uh, health and one part for the child health. And, and the big part also was dedicated for the mental health because uh, in this context, especially the kids and the minor, the teenagers, uh, and accompanying minor was in a totally abandoned status. They were stopping to eat, stopping to talk stop to play because there was no future. They couldn't go to the school, they couldn't go anything, especially when the lockdown started, they were totally close in this kind of prison uh, that the European and the Greek government organized for them. And we received many, many cases of um, self-harming uh, also, in a very, very uh, young age, eight years old, nine years old, that usually the kids at eight, nine years old should be happy, should be happy to live, to have a, a, a lot of dreams. But in Moria, it was impossible. So, um, I want to um, also explain what is a refugee camp. In general, a refugee camp should be a camp well organized to host the people that are asylum seekers in order to wait the, 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 I mean, the response about their status as a refugee or not. Is a, uh, I think, uh, is a, a way, one of the horrible way that to, uh, has a European uh, uh, citizen we can organize to host people who are so much vulnerable. Uh, and of course, in Europe, there are different kinds of refugee camps. But uh, <laughs> what I saw in Greece was one of the worst. As you can see in the picture, uh, really, there was no uh, respect of the human right, zero. So, um, no, I mean, uh, living in this camp was a, a hell, it was a real a nightmare, especially during the night where there was no light. So there was a lot of fight. Uh, a lot of people was trying to, to be safe, but it was impossible because the police, for example, didn't come, they never come inside to check what was going on. So there was no law, only uh, the stronger can survive. So, uh, for example, um, many, many women come to 
to me and say I'm scared. I can't uh, I can't sleep during night. I'm scared for my babies. I can't go to pee to go to the toilet. This was a big a big issue because many women pregnant or not pregnant, they start to uh, develop um, infection in the urine, uh, urine infection because they didn't drink too much water in order to not go to the toilet, to leave uh, the kids alone in the tent if they were single mother. Uh, also, they were super scared to go in, um, in, in the toilet or to have a shower uh, because it was very far and a very unsafe place. In this place, usually many, many rape happen. Many. All the rape in the women was in the shower and the toilet. So many women avoid to drink because I can't, I can't go. I can go there, especially now that I am pregnant because all we know that when a woman is pregnant, you have to go to the toilet often. And uh, they avoid this. Also, during the night, uh, there was some fights. So many other people tried to steal money or something else in the tent. And um, was really <laughs> my. Um, I didn't have words to 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 come sometimes to support to support them. So um, this, all this problem was not just to survive physically, but also mentally, because uh, the mental health of these people was totally uh, uh, destroyed in many ways possible. So um, because uh, there was lack of uh, uh, support uh, from the community, because in this case, in the refugee camp, there are no, uh, I mean, community. You can't trust in your neighbors. You can't uh, trust uh, in uh, the police also, or in the people that should be support you in the camp. Yeah. So uh, this part create more trauma and trauma that they already have from their original country. Yeah. And. Uh, um, and uh, and this is the, the I think uh, the highest status of vulnerability because when you are sick when, mentally, physically, when you don't have a protection from your community, when you don't have a protection from your house, you don't have a totally a safe place. You don't feel safe. You can't sleep. You have a nightmare. Uh, it's normal that you can't uh, protect yourself, you can't protect your kids. This is also. Um, so this is picture is uh, show, that, I mean, Moria was in this uh, huge uh, olive grove. And uh, as you can see, the people try to uh, organize themselves as they can. And and this is me with uh, some uh, mothers and baby was coming in our clinic. And a big part of the uh, women was uh, Af Afghan. And uh, this story is very nice because uh, this woman here, she delivered this baby on the beach in Turkey just because to before to arrive. Oh and my God. And but she was it was baby baby uh, this baby is baby number five if I am not wrong and it was very um, funny story because uh, uh, she um, decided to call this baby Marco Polo <laughs> <laughs> and for me it was funny because it's Italian name Marco Polo so I say why you call Marco Polo because it's a traveling <laughs> because it's born during the journey. Uh, and and this woman was really so strong, so powerful. She came after one month just to say, okay, I'm here, I need to be checked, but uh, I'm fine. So really a, a warrior for me was. And it was also interesting to see how they um, have a different culture, especially in Afghanistan, how they, they wrap the baby <laughs> to keep them uh, 
quiet and calm during their sleeping. And also I, I found this again in Afghanistan when I went there. Is their way to wrap the baby so sometimes I was called them a, a baby wrap. <laughs> it's my baby wrap. And then other babies. This baby born in the clinic for, for mistake because the mother have a, like a so fast delivery that the, I could, uh, we, we didn't have time to send her to the hospital. So I said, okay, let's do here. We are, uh, we, we have everything, so we can also deliver the baby here. But uh, yeah, it was very funny. And um, this story is, very, is now, she is one of my friends and uh, she's safe now, but it was very long story because she arrived to me and uh, in, uh, February, more or less, I don't remember exactly. And she didn't know nothing about her pregnancy. I mean, um, she knew that she was pregnant, but she didn't know how how far she was with the pregnancy. So um, we tried to send her to have some uh, check, but at the end, she had the cesarean section in the hospital. Unfortunately, the hospital in Italy, they are too much medicalized, but Okay, this is my opinion. I don't want to comment too much on this. And uh, uh, in Mitilini, uh, that is the city in Lesbos, uh, there is only one hospital. This hospital is, a, a, I mean, first level, doesn't have any intensive in, uh, newborn care. So if there is any complication, they send the people in Athens with fire plane or helicopter. This baby had a probably we had some uh, problem with um, or infection or, or saturation. I, I don't know exactly. So he was sent to Athens, but they couldn't follow the baby for this stupid restriction of COVID. And also because uh, they didn't have uh, still the response about the interview about their status. I so mean, they, the mother couldn't follow her baby. Exactly. Oh, so yeah. newborn, the baby was airlifted into Athens and she stayed in the camp. Exactly. Oh, and it was a crazy because she back crying. I don't know where is my baby because they didn't also explain well uh, for the lack of the um, translation. I don't know. But I know that she back in, in tears to say they discharged me, me, but I don't know where is the baby. Because they sent send me that they sent to Athens, but where to Athens? In which hospital? So we started to um, to have a big uh, uh, team work with our social worker and everything. And so we found the baby, but uh, they keep the baby for one month in Athens. One month. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine then when the baby back again? because we push in a lot to have the baby back, uh, was another baby. I mean, it's a baby of one month and uh, all the contact that uh, uh, was lost, it was lost. And, and so in, in this picture, I, I try to, I try in my small, small really work to recover that, that time. So I find that a place in the clinic where she can enjoy the time alone, put some candles, put some uh, Afghan music, they traditional music. It was a lullaby, Afghan lullaby. And uh, put them uh, naked, skin to skin, to try to recover that part that was totally lost. The connection, yeah, because she cannot yeah. even recognize her baby. The baby cannot even recognize this woman who gave birth yeah, to, exactly. to him. We to also him. tried to recover a little bit the breastfeeding. But, uh, of course, uh, as you can manage living inside the camp where you don't have, a, I mean, uh, water, privacy, uh, you don't feel safe was very complicated. We tried, she wanted so much to breastfeeding, but the, the baby was too much used also to the formula milk. And uh, of course, uh, I'm fortunately, I couldn't spend too much time with her because every day I uh, did a man around six, uh, 
between 55 and 16 uh, uh, visits. So I didn't have 16. the capacity. Yeah. Incredible. Because I, I was going very fast. And uh, unfortunately, I, I was not alone. There was another, midwife, another two midwives, but uh, it was very crazy time, very crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, because the number, as I said, of refugees was increasing day by day, and our capacity was not enough to manage these numbers. So I did my best, but also I knew that if I had more time and if she was in a safe place, like just a home, just a home, maybe we uh, could be recovered the best feeling. But uh, of course, uh, I can't blame myself. I can't blame her. We did our best. Uh, and that is important. We tried. And this, uh, and this is what we, we get. But now we, uh, the baby's um, almost two years old and is super funny baby and amazing they and now they are no more there they are in another country uh, and that's is one of the nice story because unfortunately in this context there are not too much nice story so this is our, my team and uh, just to know after um, when i left was august 2020 and uh, the situation uh, was very uh, super stressful because the lockdown continued until now. They was closed in this camp. They couldn't go in the city. They couldn't go in the market like close. But at the same time, the summer arrived, the tourists in Greece arrived. And for the tourists, there was no, of course, uh, limits. And at the, we, the COVID case start to increase. And uh, the situation was very, um, I mean, uh, under pressure because uh, every people there was super scared about the, uh, the COVID inside the camp because they say if the virus will arrive here, nobody care about us. As, as already they don't care about the essential things, they will not care about us if we start to die for COVID. So um, uh, I, what I said when I left the mission, say when they were, they, they will be the first case. Here will be there will be an explosion or something because the situation is too much is too much for them. And after one week that I left, the, there was the first COVID case. And uh, there was very tension inside the camp, a lot of fight, a lot of um, Really, I, I think that uh, was a kind of uh, like uh, something that this is preparing for exploded. And then there was the big fire 8th of September where uh, all the camp in Moria was destroyed. So the people ran away on the street. And you can imagine that was how the quantity of these people that invited totally the street, sleeping there for 10 days until the European and the Greek government find this solution that you can see that uh, is uh, another uh, military base. In Lesbos, there are many military bases because they are close to Turkey and there are many um, military training camp for the military. And uh, they just put this stand and uh, force the people, force really, literally force uh, with uh, also in a really bad, bad way to go inside this camp. So then I decided to back, not with a daughter without borders, but uh, because I was feeling I, I can still do something. I can still help these women, these people. And there was another organization, uh, a very small organization, is Italian organization that is made by midwives, but not only midwives, that want to try to support uh, the women and especially the, uh, the, the breastfeeding women. And, and so I, I work with them and I test them. 
and I say, come, uh, let's go together. Because I know all these women, I, I was there for nine months, so uh, I know what are the issues, I know what are the problems, so let's create this project. So I stayed there and I went inside the camp and for me it was very sad to see many women that were still in that situation, still there. And all the dream, all the hope to escape from that hell was totally disappeared. And uh, we started this small project that is still continue, of course, it's changed because so now this camp is, is smaller. Now there are less than 2,000 people. Little by little, they uh, send, uh, they give the answer to asylum seekers. Um, and also, unfortunately, the arrival are reduced because there are there are many pushback. I mean, uh, the 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 Greek Coast Guard and uh, and also the Turkey they push back uh, in Turkey. So the number are less now. And the project that I was mentioned is is changed many times in according of the needs. And so he is, is inside the new camp. They are still in the tent. Uh, some of them now are in, inside in the container, but as you can see, is not the place where you want to deliver your baby, where you want to grow your baby. So they have this kind of uh, um, way to make sleep the baby. Also in Afghanistan, there was something similar. And uh, we start to create uh, a small um, um, like session to talk about breastfeeding, how to increase the, um, the, the quantity of milk uh, or, or what are the dangerous sides if the baby is not getting weight or if it's not going well. Uh, inside the uh, attend, which start very, very with essential things to to create uh, some groups. Of course, in according also the languages. Some people speak French, some people speak Lingala, some people speak Farsi, Darsi, uh, and all other languages. So we also needed uh, a cultural mediator. And this was the first session uh, in French with a lot of. Uh, African women that, of course, they don't need uh, me to explain how to breastfeed them because they are amazing. But, uh, for example, in a context like this where there is very lack of um, hygiene, uh, it's very common to find um, candida infection, uh, mycosis, in the baby mounts and also on the breast. So how to treat uh, in, a, in a natural way when uh, it's time to go to the doctor, all the small things. And of course, all these things uh, make the women more powerful because they are together. So you, pre you help each other to be um, a community. Of course, sometimes works, sometimes not. And I love these pictures because um, uh, we here we have one of my amazing cultural mediators. She is Afghan girl with an amazing story. She was pregnant almost at the end of the pregnancy, and she was follow me to translate with Afghan woman. And uh, there was a big storm, so as you can see, there is, was mud and water everywhere, and then people tried to clean the tents because the water was going also inside the tents. The kids, they are still play, and this horrible wall with that is remind a lot of bad things in Europe. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this is another picture when there is a, it's still like this, eh? it's still like this when there the is storm, uh, cold, and wind. This is the situation where they live. And this is more or less uh, my work uh, in uh, Lesbos. Maybe I am uh, too long, but um, I want to mention another story that maybe could be interesting. Hey, Leonardo, do you want to come out of the screen share so you see we see your face? Ah, I am not out? 
No, uh, no you out of uh, the picture? Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, sorry. I, <laughs> it's okay. So, and so this is what was live in a refugee camp. What does mean live in a refugee camp? In that refugee camp, because if the refugee camp would be more organized where there is more protection of human rights and with more place, with safe uh, place for the single mother, for unaccompanied minor, maybe the situation will be less worse. But the problem is that uh, what I think, uh, and I, not only me, should be uh, the refugee camp is not a solution to welcome these people that are so much vulnerable. It's not a solution. It's not. Um, anyway, another story that uh, really touched me. There are many. There are many. Really, I don't know where, but I keep this because it was, uh, I think, uh, one of uh, the worst. But at the end, uh, with a happy ending, this, let's say like this. It uh, was a, a Congolese girl, 14 years old, and uh, she she was looking very big, so maybe uh, who don't know, they doesn't know the Congolese, they, they look very tall. So she was looking like 17, 18, but she was just a, a child, 14, 13. And she arrived with her mother, even if we are not sure if this was her mother, the real mother, anyway. And she arrived, uh, and I was surprised, I didn't understand what she's pregnant, maybe not, I don't know. And she was not able to talk, totally. And I she didn't... mute or, or she was yeah. just... In no, in she was follow you, but she was totally mute. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we start, uh, in this case, in this particular case, uh, the consultation was very long because I need a psychologist to Support. We work in a holistic approach to understand. And uh, this girl, uh, at the end of the story, we try to communicate with some paper, with some draft. And this girl was raped in a country after school from a group of people. And from that time, she was no more. She started to be selective mute, was a kind of uh, self-protection. She, mm. but she was able to communicate with us. So the problem was uh, how she will uh, uh, cross the, her maternity because she was pregnant five months old. As a result of the- She rape. understand it, that if she is pregnant, she understand what she has in her body. She understand this, she understand. Uh, so it was very difficult. So we started uh, also to draft to, to well to explain what there was inside her belly what it was going on and little by little uh, she started also to come by herself without her mother because we want to see her alone to see how she was reacting and uh, little by little she uh, was happy at least happy <laughs> to accept this pregnancy and I can't forget the day when she said the first word. I was, it was very emotional because I was busy to, to write uh, on the paper and check. And she was to, trying to communicate with the psychologist, my nice colleagues, and, uh, and say, OK, when you will come next time? And, and she said, no, she, she's going to tell you. And, and she said, maybe tomorrow, Tuesday. I don't remember exactly the words, but I was so emo so happy that I, I started to cry because it, it was say, wow, I can hear your voice for the first time. Uh, and still, I'm, I get emotional when I think about this. <laughs> and even listening to you, I, 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 my eyes are full of tears. I am sure that everybody <laughs> else who is listening to us is also uh, and then, feeling uh, if you young woman. Of course, uh, then uh, I was scared because, you know, when you, you deliver a baby, you get more vulnerable of, of what you are. But uh, for many reasons that I don't want to hear talk because it become too much longer, they did a cesarean section and I was very hungry because 
there was no reason of that cesarean section just because she was 14 years old. Why? And for me, it was a kind of another violation, another on her body. Um, and I feel so guilty because I couldn't protect. I couldn't do nothing to avoid this. Also because there was already COVID. Uh, I was not allowed to, to go inside the hospital. And, and uh, also the way they did a general anesthesia. So when she woke up, she said, I didn't deliver the baby. And this is true. Mm. You didn't deliver the baby. You, someone cut you and pulled the baby. And also this baby uh, had, I don't know what was the complication because sometimes they didn't tell exactly what was the complication, was sending Athens without her. Again. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I become crazy, really. I become crazy because, because say, no, this is not, again, is not possible. It's another, we are doing another violence on her. Again, again. So it um, was very heavy time uh, in generally for the cleaning because uh, the COVID, the, the pressure, the people that ask for help and help, the number that are too much, the, uh, you can't, uh, and you uh, don't have a capacity to listen to, to visit everyone. So I, I try to follow her, but then all the, um, let's say, legal part with the baby was managed by the social worker. And finally, the baby come after uh, I think uh, one month more or less also uh, and of course I, I didn't in that case I, I didn't have time and I, I didn't mention to recover the breastfeeding also because she didn't want to be touched too much mm. uh, but she came with the baby and she showed me the baby she was happy she was able to take care of the baby give him food change nappies and this is, was already a good sign. And uh, we pushed so much to put her in a high vulnerable list because more than this, I don't know which kind of vulnerable we want because uh, also at the beginning of 2020, the government, uh, the Greek law, I don't know how they reduced the vulnerable uh, criteria. Very reduced a lot. So, for example, uh, a woman pregnant was not considered so vulnerable if it was not at the end of pregnancy. Oh, my God. So, uh, many, many women before um, tried to be pregnant to have the status of vulnerable. So, some of them, for example, I, I remember she was maybe Syrian from Syria. Uh, she... Um, search for this baby in order to be in a vulnerable list. Then the law change. So when they have get the interview and they get the result, they was not considered, considered in a vulnerable status. So she tried to stop the pregnancy by themselves and, uh, and cry and, and like beat her belly to say, I don't want this baby. I don't want to put this baby in this hell. Uh, I, I tried to find this pregnancy just to get the vulnerable state to be transferred in Athens. Mm -hmm. And so the, every day there was a situation like this. And um, so let's back maybe to the subject of this day is the vulnerable. What is the vulnerability for me? As, a, as a, you can uh, say from my story for me is someone that has a wound that is sick and uh, uh, is not able or is not able to reach the the tools or or, or the people that can uh, recover from these hills and from this uh, i mean uh, uh, can't uh, recover the wounds can heal the wounds that they have and for wounds i don't mention physically but especially mentally mentally wounds and uh, and in this case when you don't have uh, any safe place when you don't have uh, uh, when your human rights are totally not respected is the maximus of the vulnerability everyone there was vulnerable for me it was uh, already 
uh, unacceptable to put a criteria to be vulnerable or not vulnerable. And, um, and, and, this, and also, um, I remind some women, single mother with their kids, that uh, how don't know really how do know they manage to carry on with their life in front of the kids because some of them was raped in front of the kids and and what made me really struggling and crazy that uh, after the consultation about the sexual violence okay i do the test i give the medication for uh, the eventually hiv infection and everything was to send them again in that place where Probably, sometimes they say, look, there is my perpetrator inside, in front of the gate. And I, and nobody cared. So this was also uh, one of, um, I don't know how these women find it, really the way to carry on, to, to smile, especially in front of their kids. I don't know. And uh, this is what also inspired me work with refugees because in generally the refugee have an incredible uh, resilience really they always find a way to smile to hope to believe of course uh the life maybe push them to be like this but some of them of course are not so much strong and also we uh, so many women that try to uh, kill themselves Try to suicide. Mm. Um, so I think uh, that um, just to conclude uh, how um, was my experience for me, uh, I did other mission, as I mentioned, uh, Afghanistan, Lesbos, and uh, South Sudan. Lesbos was for sure the, I mean, the worst uh, uh, mission that I've done in terms of humanity. I am still, but I, I was still, ha uh, still happy to be there because uh, I am kind of person that I don't want to close my eyes, I just carry on. But uh, I learned also that I have to care of myself, of my mental health, because uh, I still have a nightmares, I still uh, feel depressed when I think about these things, and uh, um, I have, I, I learned it to put a kind of uh, emotional borders to not get so deep with their pain and uh, at the beginnings it was uh, easy let's say like this because i say okay all the story that i'm listening here is a just story i'm not leaving this story but uh, it was like something that is small small go deep in your soul and uh, at one point it's look that you don't feel nothing but inside the you are you have um, a kind of monster that starts to eat your soul. So it uh, was good that of course the 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 missions finish for me, but at the same time I will never totally never forget and never also um, forgive what was done to these women to these kids and what is still done in, in other parts of Europe because my my um, uh, what was made me really crazy was I am not in Afghanistan, I am not in South Sudan, I am in Europe. I am in Europe. This is my country. Uh, how we can allow this? And the other side of the island, there are people that come for holidays, who have to go to the beach, to swimming. How how we can allow this? It's not possible because if we allow this to these people, what we are able to do to ourselves in the future, to our kids. So this it's is a powerful. It's a powerful question to to finish this uh, this uh, enormous, yeah. very painful, painful question that also shows that in some ways. Each one of us is is responsible. We cannot, yeah. Uh, we cannot say uh, somebody else is responsible. Yeah, yeah. We are a community anyway, and also people like this. You find I found in Italy. I found in France. There is, uh, for example, 
the, the border where they try to cross. Uh, but not only refugees, I mean also people that are uh, in lack of need in Italy for other reasons, also Italians or, or European. I mean, how we can be like this? And uh, Eleonora, can you, because you've been so deep in this kind of work, can you share with us and we can publish with this interview links uh, for people who, who are interested to, to do this kind of humanitarian midwives, I wonder if yeah. there's also humanitarian doula. I've, I've seen that in the UK there is some kind of uh, organization like this, doulas without borders. But yeah. how can people get involved if they feel called to do this kind of work? And if you can also share, I can, where uh, can people donate? Because sometimes it's uh, difficult to imagine many people many many organizations are asking for funds but in what cases those funds really go to the people really in the yeah. camp no so. sometimes you don't need to go necessarily on the field i mean uh, some people want some people not but sometimes it's just uh, look around our in, in deep part of our society in our city um i can share some link i i maybe i will send you because yes, uh, i don't know hey? But uh, of course, uh, the Doctor Without Borders is an international organization, so it's the top is huge and has many criteria to be recruited. But there are other way. Um, this small organization that is still on Lesbos is called Mom Beyond the Borders. Mom Beyond and the Borders. Yes, I, I will share with you Please. the links. Uh, is they are Italian, but also they try to collaborate with uh, people from uh, other countries. And uh, in general, my advice is just to be uh, careful to who is around, who is in need in our city. In our, uh, we don't need to, to go to Afghanistan, to South Sudan, not to be a human being. The vulnerable yeah. mothers are everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I agree with and, you. And sometimes just to talk, just to talk, just to listen. For example, we have a critical situation in the Belarus and Poland borders. A baby died frozen, a three months baby died frozen, and nobody talk about this. Nobody talk what is going on there. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just sometimes talk. Talk. Thank At least so much. Yeah. yeah. Talk and listen and do and do and do something. Even if, yeah. You, yeah. if it's your neighbor who something. gave birth. Uh, and do what what your soul say. I, I don't want to teach to nobody how to be human being. Everyone know what is the right things to do. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.